And um, wow, I mean, I get choked up thinking about it now because gosh, we're going back almost 40, 40 years. Everything I've given up and sacrificed was worth it because Patty, my dream was to make the Olympics, just to experience the Olympics, not to ever win them. Maybe I'd win a, a medal in the vault because that was what I was best at. It was strong, I was explosive. But to win the all around Queen Bee title, no, was never in my head. Bella thought it was possible, but I didn't think so. Patty Smith with the Harris County Houston Sports Authority and welcome to this week's edition of Queued Up. Now we hope over the last couple of months you have been enjoying all of our conversations with some of Houston's greatest athletes and sports legends and in fact tonight it will be no different except for the fact that this is our first woman that we've had on the show and this is the right woman for the job because she is no stranger to being the first. She was the first American female gymnast ever to win all around gold and bring that home to the US. She was also the first female ever put on a Wheaties box and she was the first woman inducted into the Houston Sports Hall of Fame. Of course, you know by now it is none other than our very own Mary Lou Retton. Yay. Okay. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much to Mary Lou Retton. Boy, I got to tell you, I think that might have been one of my most fun conversations and favorite interviews so far. I hope you enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Queued Up. All right, and joining us now, Mary Lou Retton. We are so happy to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm good, Patty. I'm glad um, that I'm here with you this afternoon. I'm, I'm doing very well, thank you. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about um, what you've been doing. Obviously, we've all been quarantined for the last, I don't know, two or three months. What, what's it been like for you? What are you doing? How are you spending your time? You know, pretty much like everyone else. Uh, inside trying to keep safe and, and keep healthy. Um, you know, this year was supposed to be an Olympic year and my calendar and schedule was booked up into the Olympics in Japan and then after and all that's been canceled because obviously they postponed the Olympics until next year. So uh, it's kind of nice, been a nice break to actually be a mom 24 seven for three months. I'm always in and out. My kids know me. In fact, when they were little, they all, all thought that I was a flight attendant. They would see my little suitcase. I'm serious. And then I would leave and come back because when mommy works, mommy has to go. Of course, my kids are older now. My baby is 18 and heading off to Arkansas in a couple months to do gymnastics there. So it's actually been um, quite a blessing to be able to spend the summer with her. Uh, the other are, are older and scattered, and so spending these last uh, few months with Emma has been a treat for me. Yeah, what's it going to be like to be a total empty nester? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's bad. I don't don't write in um, with four kids. It's uh, it's tough. Four daughters, daughters and moms. Man, it's a it's a tough dynamic at times. Uh, I'm happy for her because I know her life is just going to begin when she gets there. Yes, I'll miss her, but I'm looking, actually looking forward to some time for myself. Yeah, well, that's awesome. <laughs> like you said, you've got four daughters scattered all over, and you mentioned she's going up for gymnastics. A uh, little thought yes. in footsteps there. Yes, uh, three of my four daughters continued to do gymnastics in college, and my other one, Skyla, she... She was my other one um, and a, a strong cheerleader. So she did a little gymnastics, but yeah, it, it's nice. None of them really had that Olympic dream like me and, and thank goodness, um, cause that's a whole nother level. Not bad, but just a whole nother level. And I've always just said, you know, work hard and get a free education out of that. And three out of the four are doing that. And I'm, I'm very proud of them for that. 
Well, and you should be. Your four daughters, I mean, I know them all. I've had a chance to get to know them. Um, they are beautiful. They are just, they're, they're phenomenal young ladies. And of course, I really got uh, to know them all at the Houston Sports Hall of Fame induction back yes. in January, where you were inducted along with Carl Lewis and Rudy Tomjanovich. You are first female inducted into the Hall of Fame, but your daughters did a phenomenal job. They presented you. Um, can you just talk about what that night meant to you? I'll start trying. <laughs> um, it was very emotional for me, I have to say. My kids know who I am and, and they know what I've done, but I don't think that they ever realized the magnitude of it. And it was really a really special night because normally they're not at those things with me. I go up and I get a, a medal or a trophy, I make a speech and then I, you know, I go home. But to have them experience it and to see, um, I guess, their mom being honored like that was really special. And to have them, McKenna stood up and, and you know, said a few words of my intro and looking back and, and seeing them standing there was, uh, it was special. That's never happened before, except at the Houston Hall of Fame. So I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very grateful for that. It showed. It was an incredible night. And, and what about just, you know, taking the personal side out of it, of your daughters and everything, but to be, oh, well, I can go a couple different directions with this. Number one, the first, just in the Houston Sports Hall of Fame to begin with, but to go in with such an amazing class with Carl Lewis and Ruby Tomjanovich. And then on top of that, you being to be the first woman to go in. I like that. I, I tend to be the first woman a lot. <laughs> First woman to win a gold medal in the Olympics. I was the first woman they ever put on a Wheaties box. And I'm the first woman ever inducted in the Houston Hall of Fame. And that is, that's pretty prestigious, I gotta say, because Houston, man, we are filled with world-class athletes from all sports. So uh, I, that's the message I'm most proud about, is breaking those lines. And, and breaking that stigma that men are the best athletes. Men are great athletes, but us women, man, we're coming up on your heels and we want that equality. And for my daughters, who were all athletes, to see their mom up there, um, again, it was one of my most proudest moments. And I know that you have, you know, great respect for the other two that she went in with, you and Carl. Oh. Obviously, we're at the Olympics together, but the respect that you and Rudy T had for each other, it was oh. really the three of you interact throughout the night it was wasn't it it was really a fun night i mean carl he truly has been just an inspiration for me for oh my gosh decades patty i mean not only has he been what was he in three or four olympics but he won four olympics you know five are you holding up five four okay that's what i thought it was and it's like gosh I've always looked up to him. He is an incredible athlete. And Rudy, what a hometown hero Rudy is. Everybody loves Rudy. And he's just so humble and down to earth. And it was a great night. We laughed and just reminisced, the three of us, uh, through all the press stuff. And it was, uh, it was a special night. Well, you talk about hometown. And I think a lot of people don't realize now my mom is on here. She, she's an avid watcher from Florida. She's the one that's been saying, you got to get Mary Lou. You got to get Mary Lou. So I said, <laughs> have her get you, mom. to you. say, Hey Carol. Um, hey, Carol. but that I don't think she didn't know that you are a Houstonian. And I think a lot of people nationwide might not know that we like to claim you as our own, but you're, you're a self-proclaimed hillbilly from West Virginia. Aren't you? <laughs> I am, and look, no shoes. <laughs> no shoes, us hillbillies don't use shoes. Um, I'm very proud of that, yes. Almost heaven, West Virginia. That's where I lived the first 14 years of my life. Moved to Houston uh, when I was 14 to train for the Olympics and have been a Houstonian ever since. So, Houston, and I have a key to the city to prove it, so. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I've lived in Houston most of my life, and, and I do uh, make this home. All four of my daughters were born here, raised here, and Houston is, yeah, Houston's my home. So growing up in West Virginia, and I want you to kind of, now let's go back and talk career-wise a little bit. At, at what point, I know you were a pretty little kid, eight years old, I don't know, well, I, 
pretty much a little kid, although you were a pretty little kid too. But um, <laughs> tell us about what prompted gymnastics. What made you want to go that route? Well, I'm the youngest of five in a very athletic and uh, competitive family. And back in our day, back in my day, there was not much opportunity for girls in sports, especially in the teeny tiny town I was born into in West Virginia, and the name was Fairmont. Uh, so my mother put my sister and I in the, the dance. You know, there was like a dance studio in our little bitty town. We did the tap, we did jazz, we did ballet and all that stuff. But my favorite class is what they called acrobatics. And the instructor would just roll out the mats and we would flip and tumble. And that's where I found my love. Fast forward a year or two to the summer of 1976 and I was glued to the television set watching the 1976 Olympic games and of course, those of us that remember watching, we watched a little girl named Nadia from a country I'd never heard of called Romania do these amazing things. And it clicked for me. It was like at seven, watching, glued to the television set going, oh my gosh, that's what, that's what I want to do. And there's a name for it. It's called gymnastics. And so my sister and I both, we begged our mother to find us a gymnastics class. And that's where it started. Yeah, and I mean, amazing. I'm going to go off topic here a little bit, but to think here you are eight years old and you see this Nadia Comaneci on there. And now to this day, I mean, she was part of the presentation at Sports Awards. She's a friend. You call her a friend. Yes. Is that kind of cool? Oh, it's, it's surreal. It really is. Yes. Because I've, I'm, luckily, I've had the experience of being that little eight-year-old, just looking up at your role model, just thinking, I remember those feelings were so strong. Just thinking, gosh, I want to be just like her. And now I have those little girls looking up to me going, gosh, I want to do what you did. And wow. I mean, I get goosebumps when I, when I, when I say that and when I experienced it. And yes, she's a dear friend and has given me a lot of advice over the years of how to deal with all the things that we do after our sport is done, you know? Yeah, well, for sure. So how did you then, how'd you end up taking it to the next level? I don't know if that was where Bella Caroli came in, but obviously you're a 10 year old kid, whatever, just doing acrobats in a small town. Um, right. Um, my Georgia. little town of Fairmont, West Virginia was about maybe 20 miles away from Morgantown where the big university of our state is West Virginia University, go Mountaineers. And they were offering a gymnastics class and we begged our mother to take us down. It was one week, uh, once a day, I mean, once a week for one hour. And I guess some coaches that were there saw some potential in myself and they literally opened up a gym in our little bitty town of Fairmont. And, Granted, it was uh, just a cleared out garage. <laughs> Literally, I mean, my, my beginnings were extremely humble. I had to like take the, the ceiling panels out. So when we did handstands on the bars, we didn't hit the ceiling. Um, but that's really where it started. They saw some potential in me and I did that and I was doing well. And then I think I was like 13 or 14 and I was at a competition in Reno, Nevada and Bella was there. And that's kind of where he saw me, uh, pretty much recruited me. He said, you come, I want you to come to Houston, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, I mean, I'm in complete awe because this was the man who made Nadia, Nadia. And I'm thinking, he wants me? I mean, there's, I don't know. It's just those opportunities didn't happen to people like me. They just didn't, but it did. And uh, I again, begged my parents to, give me the shot to move to Houston and see if my Olympic dream would come true. So Pretty clear, much it. <laughs> clearly it did, but how did Bella really change your life and, and how did everything change from there? What did he end up meaning to you? Again, another person, I keep going back to it, but that's my baby, the sports awards. And you know, right. he's right there just talking about how much you meant to him and everything. And I know that that feeling is mutual. It, it, it really is. It was a 50, 50, you know, I think that I was, blessed with talent, but I was also blessed with him coming into my life to bring out that talent in me. I mean, 
back in West Virginia, I was the only elite gymnast in the entire state. And once I moved to Houston to start training with the Crowleys, I was maybe, you know, sixth, seventh best just in his little group. So I think that number one, that day-to-day -day competition and not fighting, but it's a healthy competition because I can remember seeing, you know, some of his older students go and do a vault and I'd, I'd slap him a high five on the way back and I'd think to myself, well, I can do that better. You know, and it was that is what Bella was master at and Bella was master at motivating. I mean, I don't know, he would just look in those, you look in those green eyes and the most passionate man I've ever met in my life. And man, if he believed in you, it was like this magical power, like you really could do it. And I don't know, it was, that's what I needed. I needed someone to believe in me. And Bella and Marta Caroli believed in me because no one else did. You know, ah, oh, you're a hillbilly from West Virginia. Ah, oh, you're not built the way gymnasts are supposed to be built. Oh, Olympics, no one from West Virginia goes to the Olympics. You know, all those things were just naysayers my entire career. And fast forward, come to the Carolis, come to Houston, they thought different. So it's nice. Well, and they got you there. And I know it was a lot of hard work and a lot of, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of years and everything, but I want you to tell, take me to that moment when you either qualified or realized or were told and you knew that you were going to those 1984 Olympics? Well, you know, back in, in my generation, it, and it's different now because they have like a panel and coaches decide who makes the team, which I'm not sure if I agree with, but back in my day, we had USA championships and then we had Olympic trials. You take the championship score, you take the Olympic trial score, you put them together and the top six kids make the team and I was first in both so I knew that I was going I knew that I had earned a spot on that team and um wow I mean I get choked up thinking about it now because gosh we're going back almost 40 40 years everything I'd given up and sacrificed was worth it because Patty, my dream was to make the Olympics just to experience the Olympics not to ever win them Maybe I'd win a, a medal in the vault because that was what I was best at. It was strong, I was explosive. But to win the all around Queen Bee title, no, was never in my head. Bella thought it was possible, but I didn't think so. And I just said, I got nothing to lose. I got nothing to lose. I'm, you know, America's best hope for some kind of medal, and hopefully I can bring something home. And, uh, I have my medals actually sitting right in front of <laughs> right in front of me. Go you get want me to bring them out. You want me to get them? Go get, them. Go get them. They're right here, literally. I just did an interview, and that's what I came home with. <laughs> I really don't wear these around the house. I don't. But yeah. They were out from a, a, a different interview, so there they are. And there's five of them there. You've got a bronze you got a silver you have the two gold and yes. um you know I, I want you to take us kind of through specifically those two perfect 10 moments that you got on the floor and on the vault um i know you've told me the story before and i just love to hear it and i want everybody to be able to hear kind of what was going through your mind and some of the back stories behind those moments to lead you to those medals it, it was um the top two gymnasts from each country make it into the all-around finals. And what's, what's really an interesting fact is, you know, back in those days, Bella and Marta had to defect. Like, young people don't know this. It was communist Romania. Um, they defected from that country and made their home now here in America. And before he left, he trained Katarina Zabo, who was the world champion going into my 1984 Olympic Games. She was supposed to win. I was injured. I had a, a broken wrist and could not make those world championships. So, I mean, she's the one everybody's looking for, but I had the inside scoop because Bella had trained her, and I was very, very knowledgeable about her strengths and weaknesses. 
And when Bella said, Mary Lou, you, you're, you can do this. I know you can do this. Again, I don't know what it, what it is about him, but um, I believed that I could. And so we're there in the, uh, the final two events of the all around. Zabo finishes uh, her beam, which she is incredible. I think she's probably scored a 10 or nine. I don't even know, because I really didn't watch her or her scores. That was something Bella was, Bella was very strict on. He says, you don't worry. That's my job. You worry about you gymnastics, you know? So that's how I was trained. That's how I was thought. So we come down to the last event. Zabo does bars. Not her best event, but she makes a nice, clean routine. Takes a big step on her dismount. You know, she didn't stick it, as we like to say in gymnastics. The score comes up. It's a 9-9. Bella comes screaming at me around Poly Pavilion uh, in UCLA. That's where, where we competed. Marilou, Marilou, you can do it, you can do it. You've got to get the 10. You know, never in my life had he ever told me that I had to make a certain number of a score. Um, but he's, God, he's just a mastermind because he knows that works for me. You tell me I can't do something, ooh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you that I can. And he says, Mary Lou, I want to see you. I want to see you now. It's now or never. Those were his words. So I said to myself, this is it. This is it. You got two vaults. Let's do it on the first. And um, vault, of course, was my strongest event. And I ran down there. I hit the vault. And I was probably one of the best vaulters in, in the world. And I can remember thinking to myself as I'm flipping and twisting, and as we like to say, looking for the landing, I was like, I was smiling. Y'all couldn't see it because I knew I was going to be able to control it. These gymnasts just have this incredible body awareness. The feet landed. The arms went up. I didn't take a step or a hop or a jump. Polly Pavilion erupted. And Bella's shouting, 10, 10, 10. And it seemed like an eternity, but the 10 comes up. And at that point, I knew that I had won, I was Olympic champion. And that was probably one of the most incredible moments in my life is running down off the podium. Bella picks me up and he's shaking me like, you are the Olympic champion. It was like, oh my gosh, you know? That was the moment that was so, so special. Well, I mean, <laughs> you can see how special it was just by listening to you to describe it, but to even take it a, a level further, as great as that would be for anyone, Again, Mary Lou Redden was the first. You were the first American to receive that all-around gold. You were also the first um, from outside of Eastern Europe to win the all-around gold. So yes. if anyone could ever understand how huge that was, not only for you, but for our country and for the sport. Absolutely. It really was. Because, you know, as we said before, just in this talk, my, my role model was Nadia from Romania, you know, communist Romania. And it's like now, American little girls can look up and say, Mary Lou, <laughs> little hillbilly from Washington, she did it. Well, that means I can do it. Yeah. Because USA was never the leader in the world of gymnastics, but now we are. And I really believe that success of myself, the men's team, and the women's team in 84 really started that stair step up to where now we dominate. The world now looks and says, what's America doing? You know, and not that I'm going to take credit for that, but I think I have a little piece in that to, to say that, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, Bella remember, I remember him telling me that when he moved here, he thought that all, all Americans are lazy. You know, he, he would say it like that, lazy. He says, I come here, I said, not true. No, it's not true at all. And, you know, for me, being his first American to win Olympic gold was special. Again, yeah, I guess I like first. I don't know. <laughs> but I, um, I couldn't have done it without them both. They uh, were truly the, the other 50% of, of my equation. I think I might just keep talking about Bella for the rest of the interview just to hear you do the <laughs> Bella. 
<laughs> he's so cute. <laughs> I didn't understand him though when he first came over. <laughs> at times too, um, when I first got here, I, I would just look at the other teammates and say, what did he say? And I couldn't understand him because his English was so broken. And he would use these words. He literally learned English on Sesame Street. I mean, they came over with maybe a dollar in their pocket. And I, I really respect that. And today, as I sit here speaking with you, he is responsible for the worth at work ethic that I have inside of me. He was one of the hardest workers I've ever seen in my life. And he stepped in that gym, you know, hour one of eight hours of workout, man, you got to give it a hundred percent or you didn't belong there. Yeah, you guys definitely have that mutual respect for each other. But after all that, you became Sports Illustrated Sportswoman of the Year. As you mentioned, you were the first woman put on a Wheaties box. You really became America's sweetheart. And I, you know, that name has followed you ever since. And I know you had some, uh, we've had conversations about that where it was like, well, I don't know if I'm up to that, but you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it, it, it could be worse, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, it, no, I, it, it was B, I was on the cover of every major newspaper and magazine around the world. It was crazy. I had no idea that my life would change like that. I mean, it's different now, obviously. Athletes have agents. We have professionals now that are in, in the Olympics. Our team back in 1984 truly was doing gymnastics for the love of the sport and for the opportunity to represent the U.S. of A. I did. I mean, if someone would have asked me, do you have an agent? <laughs> I swear I would have thought a travel agent. That's the only agent I ever knew. Now I didn't have an agent going into that. And I'm glad that, and you know, now kids get, you know, uh, money for their medals. You know, I won five. I would have loved that money to be able to pay my parents back for all that they sacrificed for me. So I'm, I'm happy that it's evolved into that. Uh, and I'm just glad to be a part of it, I guess. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't like to talk about myself. It's weird. I like to get all humble. I don't know. Well, we, we see, we see your, <laughs> in your humbleness. Don't worry. But I think what people forget is you were just 16 years old. You're a sophomore in high school when you're going through all this. I mean, how did you, or were you able to handle all that fame? You're doing Baywatch. You're doing Knott's Landing. You're going to Mary Lou's Flip Flop. I mean, it did change your life. But at 16 years old, were you ready for that? I don't think anybody could be ready for what I went through. No, I wasn't at all. And it was exciting. It was fun. And it was scary all at the same time. I mean, I was getting letters sent to me that just said Mary Lou, Olympic champion. And it went to my parents' house in West Virginia. It was crazy. Like hundreds of thousands of people would drive past. They kept yellow ribbons all up in my, you know, little hometown for years. <laughs> you know, you know, I have a street named after me. I have a park named after me. And those are all the things I guess that comes with success or, you know, people being proud that that i'm from there and i'm very proud that i'm from there and i don't know it's just uh it was impossible to prepare myself for that but the key for me was to get a team of people just like it was with the carolis and his staff now i needed a team of managers and agents to to help me just go through this crazy life that i just entered uh, no, I was not. I was literally barefoot in a leotard my entire life. And now I'm, you know, on Nancy Reagan's like guest list and eating dinner at the White House with Gorbachev and President Reagan. Like, it blow, you can't write this. It blows your mind. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I look back and it, it's, it's a surreal experience. You're so glad it happened, but surreal. You just can't write it. <laughs> yeah, and you have managed to stay humble. You've managed to your humility. You're still barefoot, so nothing has changed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's let's go. Let's fast forward. You, you know, I know throughout all of these years, you still people clamor to, you know, they see you at sports awards, they see you out, they hire you for speaking engagements. You're you were a hit on Dancing with the Stars. Oh, I got to stop there. Tell me about Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> 
Whew, and that was hard. It was one of the hardest things I have ever done, Patty. You know, and, and as a gymnast, I was never the pretty like ballet. I was known for my toughness and my explosiveness. I was never the dancer. And of course I was put with uh, Sasha, who was one of the smaller dancers and he was mean. Sasha was tough at times. And I said, listen now, <laughs> I said, I may look like I'm a teenager, but my body's beat up. You know, we, we got to bring it down. I mean, because at times we were training for Dancing with the Stars six, seven hours a day. And my body was starting to break down at that point. But my goodness, I am so glad I did it. I really, everybody always says, oh, it's such a great journey. You know, and that's what we all say, but it really is. I learned so much about myself just because I was scared to death. I mean, everybody goes on that show thinking, just don't let me make an idiot of myself. I mean, that's all we want. And I didn't want to be voted off the first night. So my, I, I reached my goal there, but wow, it was really a family there. And um, I'm so glad I did it. I was this close to saying no, but I'm so glad I did it. Yeah, and I talked to Sasha a number of times and he just, oh, yeah. you say he's mean, but he has the utmost respect for you, would bend over backwards and do anything for you. So obviously, you know, those of us that are viewers and watch that show and you see the contestants and the dancers form this bond, it really, it's true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. And I say that in, in a humorous way, he's mean. He's Russian. I mean, it's in them. All the Russians are like, you know, I'm like, Bella. Romanian, boo, boo, boo. it's the same temperament. Um, but I, I like that, that's, <laughs> you know, that's what I'm used to. And I learned so much from him, I really did. I was, I'm very, I was very insecure when I started that show, there were a lot of tears um, because I didn't believe that I could do it. And he helped me, he held my hand through the whole thing. He really did, he's a dear friend. Well, you know, you've done so many important things. We've talked about your career, and of course, the sport has continued to evolve and change, and so much of it was started with you. But you stepped up, I mean, back in 2018 and advocated for the protecting young victims from sexual abuse and safe sport. That was a big, I know it was very important to you. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the importance of that and how it has affected gymnastics today? Uh, it just, it breaks my heart because our sport is filled with such beautiful people and it's such a beautiful sport that we have to protect our athletes. I mean, I'm a mother of four girls. Three of them did serious gymnastics. It has to be safe. It has to be a safe place. And, um, you know, I don't have this answer to it, but I know that I would never let my children or anyone's children into a place that was unsafe, that didn't, um, I don't know. You, you've got to love our kids. I, I don't know, even know what to say to that, Patty. It, it scares me because I, I don't want our sport to go away, but I don't know what the solution is to keep that safe place in. It's tough. Yeah. Mm. It's important you to take a stand, and I mean, you're to be commended for that. And But let, let's Thank just... You. Let's talk a little bit about gymnastics today. And I don't know if it's something in the water here in Houston, but you talked about you looking up to Nadia and now some of these younger girls look up to you. And we've got another superstar here in Houston in Simone Biles. And it's got to be amazing even for you to look at someone like that and see what she's doing. Oh, yes. I mean, I can remember uh, I had uh, for, for a time, I think it was, I don't know, maybe a few years, I had the Mary Retton Invitational and we had it at George R. Brown. <laughs> and there's this little gymnast named Simone Biles that won it. You know, this is kind of before Simone was Simone. And I can remember watching her thinking, oh my gosh, this one is special. I mean, and, and look, she's, she's in a different league. She really is. Her physical ability, her physical strength is something you don't teach. It gets... I mean, everybody's just in awe of, you know, what's she going to do next? And it's crazy. She's just in the category all by herself. But Houston is definitely the hotbed of uh, world gymnastics. It used to be Dallas, but it's, it's back to Houston now. And it, that's only because of Simone and, and her gym that she runs and a lot of good athletes up there.
and good coaching. And, you know, Simone, not just Simone, but obviously all the Olympians that were prepared to go to Tokyo this year. Do you have any sense for what it's like for them at this point to have gotten this close in a training standpoint, both mentally and physically? How, if it is postponed or canceled, um, can you talk or speak to how that affects them or how that affects this competition? I, I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't imagine if the 1984 Olympics were canceled. I mean, everything that I had done, I left home. I'm, you know, 13 years old. I'm, I, <clears throat> the only thing that I can say is that, and I can't speak for everybody, but just myself, that being such an elite athlete, you don't teach that. You don't teach that passion. So I think everybody takes a break. Everybody rests their body. But then you've got to get your mind back once we hear, you know, what they've decided to do. I don't even know what they've decided to do. I know that they said they were going to postpone it till next summer. That's okay. But if they come back and say, we're canceling the Olympics, oh, my goodness. That just squashes so many people's dreams so many people's dreams. I, I would be devastated. I really would, because my whole life was about making that Olympic team and representing the U.S. of A. Yeah, that'd be a, that's a tough one to swallow. All right, you're ready? Woo! Yeah, let's really would. Up, let's line it up and have a little fun with our little game we play called Q19. That's 19 questions. I usually don't get to 19 of them, but quick fire answers. Oh my gosh, all right, I'll do my best. You ready? This is all of course. This is their favorite part of the show. They, they sit here and are writing in right now. They love this. So, all right. The last show are the shows you've been binge watching while you've been uh, locked down here in quarantine. Um, below deck Mediterranean. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to talk about some of this stuff later. All right. Movie of all time. Rocky, the original. Okay. Uh, celebrity crush, either back in the day or now. Oh, back in the day, Matt Dillon. <laughs> and now? Oh, oh gosh. Um, still Matt Dillon. <laughs> no, maybe still Matt Dillon. No, no. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Come back. I'll come back. Okay. I don't know. What kind of music do you listen to? Um, R&B. Okay. Uh, we may know this one. I don't know. Maybe not. Most prized possession? My daughter's. Of course. Are they really Ooh. possessions, Mary Lou? Huh? Are they really possessions? Possession. Oh, come on. Possessions. <laughs> um, That's how I'd answer. You're good. I don't know. I mean, my dad, they're, they're my best accomplishment. We'll go with that. That's a good one. All right. All right. Favorite place you've ever traveled? Italy and Greece. Okay. Somewhere you'd like to go that you haven't been yet. Australia and New Zealand. Are you super And Antarctica. And Antarctica. Those are the only, like, continents I've never been on. So those are the places I want to go. That's a bucket list thing. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and then my bucket list is a question coming up, so I might have to skip that one. But are you superstitious? Yes. Tell me some superstitions you have. Um, in, in training, like, if I ever had a bad workout or I hurt myself in a workout, I would – throw the leotard away never wore it again um and then i always you know we have all these stuff we put on our hands and we had gym shoes back in my day so always put the right on first and then the left would come that's a must all right uh, we all have these if we're moms we have these mom sayings uh we tell our kids every time my kids walk out the door i say make good decisions what's your best mom saying live your life with no regrets Okay. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The harder you work, the luckier you get. Who gave it to you? Who do you think? Bella. Bella. <laughs> Bella. All right. Anything else on your bucket list besides Antarctica? Well, I, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to bungee off the New Zealand. There's apparently New Zealand has like the highest bridge that you can bungee jump off of. But because I've got metal hips, can't do that anymore. <laughs> so I've got to, I've got to replace that uh, bucket list. But no, my bucket list was maybe skydive. 
and because I'm a thrill seeker. I've got that just, I want to just take risks. I want to skydive and I want to hit all continents in my life. Awesome. All right, the last one, and this is the question I wrap it up with everybody. I've asked every athlete we've had on here. Um, when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? I want my legacy to be, ah, oh, that Mary Lou Retton. Yeah, she's the first woman that ever won the Olympics for us. But my gosh, what a great mom she was. That's my legacy that I want. I want my daughters to be proud. And you know they are. We've all seen it. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much to Mary Lou Retton. Boy, I got to tell you, I think that might have been one of my most fun conversations and favorite interviews so far. I hope you enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Cued Up. <laughs>